Hello everyone. Welcome to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at Ilo Pathology. This is the part 10 of inflammation chapter which I am discussing from the last few months. In today's tutorial, we will be discussing about the systemic effects of inflammation. In the previous tutorial, that is uh, inflammation part 1 to part 9, we discussed various aspects of acute and chronic inflammation, right? So I'll be posting all the links below. You can find and uh, watch these videos in leisure so that you can understand the concepts of systemic effects of inflammation very well. Now coming to the topic proper, the next 10 to 15 minutes, we will understand what are the various manifestations of uh, inflammation in the form of what is acute phase response and the various clinical features and pathological features associated with acute phase response response. Now we need to know that inflammation, even if it is localized, it is usually associated with systemic reactions and that is cytokine induced. Okay, And this cytokine induced systemic reaction is referred to as acute phase response, which is stimulated by bacterial products and various other stimuli like tumor necrosis factor, interleukin 1, interleukin 6 and various interferons. Now what is this acute phase response? Let us understand uh, this by understanding the various clinical features associated with acute phase response and the various pathological features. The clinical features include fever, it could be increased pulse and blood pressure, it could be decreased sweating, it could be shivering, that is rigors or search for warmth, that is chills, anorexia, somnolence and malaise. The pathological features including elevated levels of acute phase proteins and the, I mean, the blood investigations which can uh, show thrombocytosis, leukocytosis, sometimes in the long-standing cases even anemia. Now what is fever? Fever is basically, you all know that it is elevation of body temperature, usually by 1 degree Celsius to 4 degree Celsius and the substances that induce fever are referred to as pyrogens. These pyrogens can be exogenous pyrogens or endogenous pyrogens. The exogenous pyrogens are basically the products of bacteria that is lipopolysaccharide and these bacterial products through the immune cells they help in release of endogenous pyrogens which are cytokines. Basically they are interleukin 1 and tumor necrosis factor. Now what does this interleukin 1 and tumor necrosis factor do? These Cytokines are the ones which upregulate the cyclooxygenase activity and then they produce prostaglandins. Now what do they do? They increase the cyclooxygenase activity. Now where do they do? See basically the vascular and perivascular cells are of the hypothalamus. They are more sensitive to these cytokines. Because of upregulation of cyclooxygenase, they synthesize prostaglandins and these prostaglandins act on the hypothalamus to release various neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters can cause vasoconstriction which basically reduces the loss of heat and through the brown fat and skeletal muscle, they also increase the heat generation in the body. So the combined effect of reduction of loss of heat and increase in heat generation is what resets the body temperature to a higher level and that is what we refer to as fever. So this is how fever actually happens in case of inflammation. Now I think you should understand that it is through inhibition of these cyclooxygenase we can reduce the fever, right? So that is where your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs act. So other clinical features include increase in the pulse rate, increase in blood pressure, there will be sweating which is decreased. This decreased sweating is uh, because of redirection of the blood flow from the cutaneous to the deep vascular beds. Okay? Once that happens, it minimizes the loss of heat through the skin and that is why there is decreased sweating. Patients can also manifest with increased uh, shivering which we refer to as rigor. Patients can search for warmth which is referred to as chills. There will be loss of appetite which is referred to as anorexia. They feel sleepy, they feel drowsy which is referred to as somnolence. Malaise is uh, a vague discomfort which is happening uh, to this particular patient. Okay, So all these are the systemic effects of inflammation. All these are clinical manifestations of this acute phase response. Now what are the pathological features? 
now we understood the various clinical features right so what are the pathological features which tells you that there is inflammation going on okay so the pathological features include elevated levels of acute phase proteins we will understand acute phase proteins in more detail other than that there will be leukocytosis there will be thrombocytosis i also told you that there could be anemia in cases of chronic infections now what are these acute phase proteins Acute phase proteins are the plasma proteins which are synthesized by the liver as a part of response to these inflammatory stimuli. We know that because of inflammation there is release of various cytokines, right? Cytokines in the form of interleukin 6, it could be interleukin 1 or tumor necrosis factor. Now this interleukin 6 stimulates the liver to produce these two plasma proteins which are C-reactive proteins in short they are referred to as CRP and fibrinogen. The interleukin 1 and tumor necrosis factor helps in synthesis of serum amyloid protein that is SAA. So these three are the important acute phase proteins which are elevated during acute inflammation. What are these? They are C-reactive protein, the fibrinogen and serum amyloid protein. So C-reactive protein and serum amyloid protein basically have this have similar function that is you know they bind to the microbial cell wall and they act as opsonin you know these proteins go and bind on the microbial cell wall and they help the phagocytes they help the macrophages to identify these microbial cells and thereby help in phagocytosis. So they also bind to the chromatin which helps in clearing of the necrotic or the dead nuclei. So basically these are the beneficial effects of these acute phase proteins. What does fibrinogen do? Fibrinogen binds to the red blood cells and because of binding of fibrinogen to red blood cells that results in increase in the role formation that is stacking of RBCs one above the another. When you estimate an erythrocyte sedimentation rate or ESR so you this is the reason for increase in a rise in ESR in cases of inflammation okay that is a mechanism why ESR is increased in inflammatory states because the fibrinogen binds to RBCs and forms role and you know the stage of re, uh, stages of ESR, right? One of the stages formation of role and then sedimentation. So now that we know the beneficial effects of uh, acute phase react, acute phase proteins, we also should know what are the harmful effects of elevated acute phase proteins. If the inflammation is prolonged, so there will be prolonged production of serum amyloid protein, right? And that results in a condition called amyloidosis, which is secondary amyloidosis. Now, I have talked about amyloidosis in great detail in my earlier videos. I think you can go back to those videos and watch about amyloidosis. So another thing we need to know is in patients with elevated CRP levels, okay, these are the ones who have increased risk of myocardial infarction, in particularly in patients with coronary artery disease. Now there are other proteins which are synthesized by the liver, they are hepcidin and thrombopoietin. Apart from the three uh, major acute phase proteins I talked, these are the two important proteins you need to remember. They are hepcidin and thrombopoietin. Thrombopoietin is a major growth factor for megakaryocytes and they help in stimulation of uh, more and more platelets. That's why you find more and more platelets in the peripheral smear that is thrombocytosis. Hepcidin is the one which reduces the availability of iron to the erythroid precursors. You know, iron is an important component for the production of heme, thereby hemoglobin and the RBCs which are produced by these iron deficient erythroid precursors will be anemic. And that is the reason for anemia in cases of chronic inflammation. This is, a, this is an important entity which is referred to as anemia of chronic inflammation, which is mainly due to the production of hepcidin which reduces the availability of iron to the erythroid progenitors. So other laboratory findings are, I told you, leukocytosis, right? Now, how does leukocytosis happen? Again, the same cytokines play a major role. The cytokines like TNF and interleukin-1, they accelerate the release of granulocytes from the bone marrow, which can result in leukocytosis. Other than that, in cases of prolonged infections, the macrophages are activated and also the stromal cells in the bone marrow are activated and these activated macrophages and marrow stromal cells increases the production of colony stimulating factors thereby there is increased proliferation of precursors so all these things the combined effect is manifested as leukocytosis 
and leukemoid reaction leukocytosis we all know that it is increase in the leukocyte count the normal leukocyte count being 4000 to 11000 cells per cubic mm right anything more than 11000 is in a normal in an adult is leukocytosis notice leukemoid reaction i mean the increase is so much that it sometimes resembles that of a leukemia but it is not leukemia by definition by criteria and hence it is called as leukemoid reaction the counts will be around 50000 to 1 lakh cells per cubic mm okay it is not leukemia it's in between leukocytosis and leukemia so that's leukemoid reaction so the bacterial infections are the ones which can give rise to neutrophilia Viral infections are the ones which can give rise to lymphocytosis that is increase in the lymphocyte count, relative lymphocyte count. The eosinophilia is seen most commonly in allergic, in, you know, allergic conditions and parasitic infestations. Some infections like typhoid, a few viral infections, some rickettsial infe rickettsial infection, sometimes some protozoal infections. W what happens in these infections is that, you know, there will be sequestration of activated white blood cells in the vascular spaces and in tissues. And that result in decrease in the leukocyte count. So they actually manifest with leukopenia. So leukopenia is also a manifestation of inflammation some in these uh, conditions like typhoid, few viral infections, rickets, cell infection and protozoal infections. So remember leukocytosis and leukopenia could be a manifestation of inflammatory process. Now what happens if the inflammation, if the infection is extremely severe, extremely more, so it results in more and more production of cytokines and more and more productions of cytokines will be more harmful to the body. They result in something called disseminated intravascular coagulation and can progress to hypotensive shock and various metabolic disturbances. So this collective is referred to as septic shock or also referred to as systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So remember, we talked about acute phase response, which is manifested clinically as well as pathologically. Clinically, you know that we have fever, uh, increased pulse pressure, rigor, chills, malaise, somnolence and everything. Okay, and uh, leukocytosis, thrombocytosis, anemia and rise in acute phase proteins as a part of pathological features. So this is in brief about the systemic effects of inflammation. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like button. Do comment if you have any questions. I would be happy to answer any queries if you have. Don't forget to subscribe this channel because I'm sure uh, you can expect more videos in the near future. And please do share so that others can be benefited as well. Thank you.